into a, a conversation around uh, well, yes, the world of AI, the world of crypto, but also the world of data, uh, because this is an opportunity really to get a check on the pulse. Uh, $390 billion of on-chain value that's been added in the Middle East in the last year in North Africa, which is about 7.2% of global transactions. In terms of what you're seeing in the real-time data, could you run us through sort of the biggest trend right now, especially post ETF and post stable coin? Yeah, I would still say stable coin is still a trend. So we, we clearly see that the growth in stable coin volume continues to, to rise. We also see that um, more and more stable, like more and more, more balance on, on stable coins, treasuries are being bought on stable coin, using stable coins. So we definitely see a huge growth in that one. They're being transacted all over the globe, so that's, uh, that's definitely a, a huge trend there. I would also say with, um, with the rise of, uh, of the price of Bitcoin and, on, on Ethereum, we of course have seen transactions volume pick up. So it goes to, for every exchange, every use case and so on is starting to grow again. So do you have a call on the price or do you just uh, sort of monitor from the sidelines and uh, cheer on a little bit? I, I probably cheer on from the sideline. I can tell you my, my somewhat, I think it's in one side, it's a very positive view and, and others would say it's a very dark view on the price of Bitcoin, but I can, can give you that one. And basically as I see it, I think that we will see the blockchain and the blockchains out there, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever is, else is out there. We will see them as the, the infrastructures for finance in the future. We will not see Bitcoin or Ethereum as the world reserve currencies. That will still be dollars, it will be dinar, it will be all of the things that we, we know, but they'll now move on blockchains. So that means Bitcoin or Ethereum becomes the fee you can pay to participate in, in value transfer. And that's maybe not as big as maxes of, of Bitcoin would, would like it to be, but it's definitely a huge, uh, a huge part and like long term it has some, some pretty uh, interesting potentials. In Chainalysis is celebrating its uh, 10th anniversary. When you look at past decade, did it evolve the way you thought it would or did it happen faster and what does that kind of tell us about the next 10 years? It's a good question. So I remember back in 2015 uh, where we just started to, uh, to work with the first bank. We had Barclays as a customer back then and we thought that like now we'd be bank, 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 every one of the banks would get into crypto. That was not exactly the journey. At the same time, I underestimated how much the crypto exchanges would grow and how important they became of the, of the world of finance as they are today. Payment processors came next and we actually still waiting a bit for the banks to enter the space. So, I mean, when does that get unleashed then? I mean, because conversations I've had so far uh, in the last few hours, I mean, show that sort of conventional banks are very keen not to fall asleep by the wheel. And there are a few specific examples, but I don't want to mention them here. Uh, but is there anything on the regulatory front that you would say could open that door? Yeah, regulatory in, in the US, uh, right now it's complicated for banks to custody crypto because they need to collateralize with similar amount of dollars and dollars right now cost five, six percent to hold. So it's expensive to store crypto. So they're not doing that. So that needs to change. At the same time, clarity around stable coins and issuance of those, accepting them and, uh, and using them as, as, a, as a means of transfer of, of funds, I think is another thing that can help in terms of, of regulation. And if there's more clarity on that, I think the banks will step in. At the same time, don't underestimate the, the power of momentum. A bank would step in any time if momentum is big enough. And how has your client base shifted as of late? I mean, in terms of state actors, non-state actors, what about geographic breakdown? Uh, just uh, give us a little bit of context on that. Yeah, so we are, in terms of revenue breakdown today, we, I think we are like around 70% is uh, public sector uh, we work with. So we have a huge public sector base. They are, I think we have around 250 public sector institutions in 50 countries in the globe. So basically in every country you can name, we will have uh, one or all of the government agencies from law enforcement, tax to intelligence agencies and others working with us to keep, keep the citizens safe. And what is crime like vis-a-vis uh, -vis Bitcoin? And you're, you have the ability to put a number on that in terms of percentage of total monitored transactions for the lack of a better word. Uh, where are we with that? 
So usually every year we look, at, uh, we look back a year and say what actually happened. I think right now we are hovering around 30 basis points in terms of, of criminal activity. That's anything from scams to sanction evasion, terrorist financing, ransomware, a lot of other things. So it's, it's a number that's bigger than you would look at, for example, on the Visa network, but it's a number that's smaller in, in credit card networks in countries with traditionally relatively high crime numbers. The interesting thing, there's two interesting aspects of that. One of them is that the relative number tends to decline year over year. The only time it really jumped was be lot of, because of a lot of a sanction designation happening uh, related to the war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the other piece is that the absolute number tends to grow. And that means that it's something that we, of course, you still have a, a strong focus on and ensure that we, we can investigate and, uh, and basically, uh, yeah, get, to, get people to justice. What do you do when uh, two entities uh, ask for investigations on each other? We haven't seen that, I think. And also, we don't really, uh, we're not really part of that equation because normally what happens is that we sell software and data to investigators. So you can have, uh, you can have an investigator sitting in, in one government and another one in another government, and if they're using our software to investigate each other, we wouldn't know. So that's kind of how, how it would play out there. Okay. I want to turn to the Middle East a little bit, uh, the office in Dubai, and you're looking to expand. Uh, what are some of the possibilities that you're looking to leverage in the next few months and over the next few years as well? So I think the interesting thing with our office in Dubai, many things that we are basically having that office to serve, serve Dubai. But what we actually chose to do is that this is our office for South EMEA and MENA. So it also services Italy and, and Spain and other countries in, in Southern Europe. So it's kind of covering a lot of area, also down to, to Africa. So, so it means for us, it's really a bet on Dubai as the center of that region, spanning all the ways from Southern Europe and all the way down to the Southern parts of Africa. We have a lot of expectation of growth there. Of course, in, so in Southern Europe, that's, that goes without saying. But also, we have seen some of the regulation and some of the openness that we've seen in Dubai towards new companies and newcomers. So that means we have seen a lot of activity in, in crypto, in stable coins here in this region, both from retail, from peer-to-peer -peer transfers and others. So we foresee a lot of, of interesting activity here. And we'll continue to use this office as, as a hub for that. So how many more people are you going to hire? It's hard to say. Right now, we are between 15 and 20 people in, in the office here. And we will probably be growing that like consecutively over the, over the time. Could you also perhaps break down a little bit the Middle East and Africa? I mean, we talked about Dubai, but where else is there a bit of a hotbed of activity in terms of demand for your products and demand for your figures? I would say the, the regions here is probably around uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, uh, Saudi. That's like the main, the main hubs in, in this part. In Africa, we see multiple different countries moving at the same time. And it's like, it's very diverse in Africa. Some are very small, small uh, immature economies, and others are like well-scaled up economies where there's a lot of activity going on. What was, what was the evolution going to look like for chain analysis uh, in the next uh, two to three years. You talked to us about you know, where you are and where you're putting your assets, but from a technological point of view, from your emergence and fame from the knowledge graph, right? And that became kind of uh, the backbone of, of chain analysis. What's going to kind of propel that in the next couple of years? Is it try and stay ahead. Yes, so the interesting thing now is that mainly because of the growth of stable coins, we now are in a world that I, I didn't see coming this fast. And it's a world where basically every organization, let's say every crime syndicate, every group of people, every city, have people holding Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies of various kinds, mainly stable coins. And that means that you can now actually use the data on the blockchain and our attributions to size and measure the economy. Not just the crypto economy, but the real economy. That, that means, for example, that you can size different crime syndicates and you can suddenly investigate global crime using crypto. Not because that crime uses crypto as a majority, but just because crypto has become pervasive. It's everywhere. Stable coins are everywhere. So the, the likelihood of someone using them also for a criminal purpose is very high, and that you can use to size crime. We are using that as like a data platform that we offer various governments mainly, to be able to size and understand their region and how they can better protect their citizens. Just catching up earlier with the uh, 
chief innovation officer of BlackRock, and he was talking about some of uh, the trickier issues that he's facing in dealing with varied locations and regulatory frameworks and guardrails for AI. I'm wondering, given that you're a global player, given that we just saw the EU pass a major legislative AI bill, is that becoming a headache for you having to deal with these individual geographies and what they're asking? It hasn't really yet. I think the main, I would say, frameworks that we are looking at are something that's more like 10 to 20 years old. It's more like, like uh, PII frameworks, like re data residency, and that's more our customers that would go and ask, hey, can you ensure that data around Dubai is stored in Dubai, for example, and other things? So it's, it's, uh, it's frameworks that we have seen for a long time. We haven't really been, been hit and, and like hurt by any of the other regulations right now, mainly because we are just a data provider. And then what about uh, sort of investing in the finer technology? And you talked about what you're doing vis-a-vis -vis clients. I'm wondering what kind of physical infrastructure you need to invest in to keep up with your growth ambitions and, and where that capex is going as much as you can speak publicly because obviously you know, you're still a private company. Yeah, I would say in terms of, of CapEx, of course, well, we don't, we're not in a world anymore where people buy data centers. We are not buying data centers, so, so we are not CapExing that, to put it that way. Uh, we do have offices in many locations, uh, this, this being one of them, but we also have in, in New York where our headquarters is and so on. Uh, I don't see us being a good, a big CapEx spender as a company, to be honest. What about some of the central banks and how they are dealing with AI and sort of crypto and the blockchain and sort of the whole space. If you had to point out one jurisdiction that's ahead of the game, not sure that would be the Fed, but probably another one, maybe somewhere in, in Asia or in the Middle East. Yeah, I think it's, it's a hard question, right? Because not a lot have actually happened in terms of scale and, and adoption there. There are a lot of ideas, and it tends to be the case when you talk to central banks that there are a lot of ideas. Uh, I think the interesting thing with the entire crypto and blockchain space is that it kind of federates the world and makes it more global. So the need for, for very locked down local solutions are probably less in that world. And I think that many central banks will wisely sit back and, and look at things and, and await things. I would say in terms of regulators, I would say Singapore has been very forward. Uh, I would also say that, that here in Dubai, there's a lot of interesting conversations going on and definitely a lot of listening to the industry to trying to understand how the regulation is shaped up in the right way. Uh, part of your journey over the last 10 years has seen a phase where you dealt with all kinds of claims of, let's say, not 100%, potentially not 100% accuracy when it comes to some of the forensic data. I know you've spoken about this in the past, but I'm wondering how you continue to build trust and overcome some of those fears that maybe the data is not as right as we want it to be. So we had a very interesting case recently. That was uh, a case ran by the uh, Department of Justice against the, the founder of Bitcoin Fog. And in that case, uh, our, our data and our me methodologies and our algorithms got scrutinized. It went through what you would call the Daubert hearing, uh, which basically means that you have experts assessing it, you have government witnesses assessing like what have you seen over the years, and it basically came out with a AAA. Every, all of the data held in, held in, in court, it was like a, a huge win. It was a huge win for chain analysis in that sense, because we are now the only company that's doing blockchain analysis that have data of a, of a quality that can actually be used in a court. So of course, it's something that's near and dear to me because it's real people and it's real cases and other things, so the data need, be, need to be a high quality. And it's our first opportunity to really showcase the quality of our data. What about uh, prospects for collaboration? I mean, who are you teaming up with? Where do you see more scope for working together, creating synergies and creating new ideas more than anything? Yeah, it, it's a great question. So I think there are many, many opportunities for us to collaborate. Of course, we are always welcoming uh, university collaborations. We have m already uh, numerous of those. But on the, on the company front, uh, as I mentioned before, we sell, we sell data and software to governments. 
And oftentimes, they also need bodies. They need investigators to do things. And there are many local investigation, uh, I would say, contractor, contractors. It's like Bruce Allen's and Deloitte's in the US. But there are similar companies he here. We love collaborating with those because we can educate them and they can provide a fast value uh, for, for governments in terms of investigation services. I mean, after all this, uh, are we going to see you go IPO soon, or is that not something you're looking at? I, I would say uh, the interesting thing in the market today was that like the, the size of a company in terms of when you would go IPO probably like quadrupled uh, in terms of what were the economies of scale you were expected to have before you went out in the, in the public market. And that's basically why we have seen this like, I would say the line of, I, of companies going IPO at some point, they would be at X, X hundred million dollars, and now they're like at a way, way bigger number. So no one have gotten into that growth yet. We are like on that journey as well, growing at relatively high numbers. So at some point, we will get there, and then it will be on the table again. All right, we'll definitely be uh, on the lookout for that. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughts uh, on a lot of these uh, important themes. And uh, of course, a big thank you again to our audience.